All right, folks, welcome to part two in our series on general ecology and trophic dynamics. Um, today, uh, we're just going to finish up actually this lecture and um, we're going to talk a little bit more about trophic dynamics. So uh, last time we talked about ecological organization, um, but I really want to shift gears and really explain why ecosystems are organized the way that they are. So um, the last thing we did discuss were really, you know, uh, trophic levels, right? Starting at primary producers, right? The, the organisms that are uh, what we call autotrophs that generate their energy essentially from getting it from the sun or from chemicals at the bottom of the ocean. And then, and then we move up from there. We got primary producers um, feed primary consumers, which feed secondary consumers and tertiary consumers and quaternary consumers and so on and so forth. Um, but today, I really want to talk about why that matters again. Um, and most of that is for biodiversity, right? Anytime you have increased um, players in a food web or in a trophic web, um, you're going to have more biodiversity or vice versa, right? It's kind of like a chicken and egg thing. And so you tend to see the most... Um, uh, players in an ecosystem in uh, places where you're going to have more biodiversity and the tropical rainforest uh, reigns supreme here. So particularly the cloud forest, uh, there has been some ecologists that have found that you can go up seven different levels in a trophic web, but you can't get far beyond that. Uh, for one reason or another, once you get to level seven, right, which would actually be a hexenary consumer, for that is going to be your apical predator. You can never get above hexenary, the which would actually be a heptonary, right? Um, and, and this is the reason here. So this is what I want to explain. There's a principle out there called Lindemann's rule. And Lindemann's rule um, is, essentially, is essentially this. So um, Charles Lindemann, the man that discovered this, uh, found that um, every time an organism eats something below it on the trophic web or an, uh, something below it on the trophic uh, tr uh, from a trophic level below, 90% um, of the energy is lost with each time that the original energy is passed forward. So I want to actually give you a visual, a, a visual of this because I think this is actually quite amazing and it explains why from outer space um, you see what you see. So all right, if I, if I put like a very simple food chain um, on this pyramid for you, um, and the pyramid's set up to show you um, distribution, right? And, and, and I think this is going to explain, you know, why is it we have so much more green on planet Earth, right? I mean, if you look at the planet, it's essentially blue, right? But take away the 70% of the Earth's surface that's covered with water. And then you, you got deserts, about 20% a, about a of the Earth's land is desert. But if you take away that, we're looking primarily at... Um, you know, photosynthesizers, green. Why, though, are we not instead seeing, like, the majority of the planet eagles? Well, that that principle, I think, even a kindergartner can explain to you, but they probably couldn't explain it using Lindemann's rule. So uh, let's just say that this patch of grass right here, um, let's say that that patch of grass has 10,000 calories worth of energy in this, in this patch that you're seeing right here, in these primary producers. And let's also say that these butterflies, like a, a group of butterflies, ate all of this grass. Um, what Lindemann found was that in order to transfer the energy found in, these, in this patch of grass to the butterflies, those butterflies are only going to end up um, keeping about a thousand of those calories um, making up their bodies. A lot of that energy is going to be lost to digestion, um, uh, lost to other basal metabolism processes, but only, uh, only one-tenth of the energy in the grass actually becomes the butterflies, right? Which means we have 90% fewer calories to pass on to the next trophic level, right? These, um, these cardinals right here, these birds. So if the birds were to eat the butterflies um, of the original energy, let's say it ate all the butterflies, of the original energy coming from the patch of grass, the birds are only going to get about 100 calories of the original energy. And the snake then will get only about 10 calories of that original energy. And then that um, from the energy that we started with, that 10,000 calories that we started with, how much ends up all the way up here at our apex predator, our eagle? Only one. Now, I do want to correct something. <laughs> There are a lot of people that um, misconstrue what I'm saying here. I am not saying that it, that an entire bald eagle has is is one calorie, right? A stick of gum has more calories um, in it than that. Um, what I'm saying is, if we're following the trophic web here, if we're following this food chain, only one of the calories that was found in this patch of grass made it to the eagle. 
right? That is fundamentally why we see the world as we see it. Let me show you it another way. So um, what Lindemann said is that you are have to have more, more players at the bottom of your trophic web than you do at the top because the players at the bottom are feeding those at the top, right? I mean, if you think about it, you can't have more, um, you can't have more consumers than the food that they're consuming, right? Uh, so we see this in a number of different ways ecologically. So uh, I'm going to give you a specific example here of looking at the zebra compared to the lion. So we got a zebra. If we go to the Sahara Desert, um, or sorry, to the, um, the safari, uh, safari in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, right? What would we see? So let's take a look. Um, statistically, now this is going to be really time consuming for a reason. I sort of did this to illustrate a point. So if we look at the zebras, how many zebras would we see if we if we um, look out at the Great Plains? Um, and we would see something like this. So I actually animated every single one of these zebras <laughs> just for dramatic effect, right? So these are all zebras. You'll notice I haven't yet I have yet to come across a lion. So as these zebras are flying in here, right? If you were to count them all up. I'm going to just speed it along here just because even though I wanted it for dramatic effect, this is taking too long, right? Uh, there are 999 zebras there. There's our lion. And where is he going to go? Right in the bottom, right? I don't know if you guys see him down here. Um, but our lion makes up one one thousandth of the, uh, of the zebras that we see. And that makes sense because zebras are herbivores, right? They're eating vegetation. They're really, really low on our, let me go back. They're really, really low on this, um, on this, this, this trophic, on this trophic web. A lions, on the other hand, are way up on the top. Ecosystems can't support the same number of apex predators as it can herbivores because apex predators fundamentally have less to eat. Right? As you move up, you have less to eat. So um, one last thing I wanted to show you. Sorry, I'm trying to move along here. Too many animations. Oh, gosh. Um, this We can also see the, these impacts um, as they have it on predator-prey relationships. I'm actually going to grab a pencil here, too, because I think I'm going to need it in one second. Oops. I think I might need to change the pen color here. Pen color. Let's make it green. Okay. So um, I want to talk a little bit about predator-prey relationships, right? Um, unfortunately, you know, humans were a little bit blessed, right? You and I get hungry. We had to piggly wiggly or pick and save and pick up our meal for the day. Unfortunately, animals in nature don't have grocery stores, right? They have to actually um, under, they have to essentially either scavenge or become predators to, to get their food. So we see predator-prey relationships all over, but they're easiest for ecologists to um, study when they're really, really strict. So I'm going to look at a couple here. I'm going to look at that of a Kodiak bear and salmon or that of a Canadian lynx and a snowshoe hare. Um, so these predator-prey relationships are so strict um, that essentially if Kodiak bear didn't have salmon to eat, they would start to die. Um, they are so picky about what they eat that uh, when salmon populations are low, they start to starve. Um, and the same is true actually for the Canadian lynx and the snowshoe hare. So uh, let me show you what this looks like. First, just for fun, <laughs> let me put this back. I hope this works. Go back with my arrow here. At the river mouth, the bears catch only the tastiest, most tender salmon. Which is exactly what we at John West want. John West endured the worst to bring you the best. <laughs> so obviously that was just a stupid commercial. Um, but clearly, I mean, John West knows their stuff because we were taking advantage of this predator-prey relationships between these uh, Kodiak grizzly bears in order to get our delicious salmon, right? If that's all they eat, let's let them catch it for us. So anyway, 
let me show you. Sorry about that. Uh, let me show you what this looks like now. So um, I'm actually going to graph here the relationship between Canadian lynx, right, these big cats, um, and snowshoe hair over time. Now, what time frame are we talking? It doesn't really matter, right? We could go all the way back to like, let's say this is the 1950s, and we can say that this is present. Either way, we're moving forward in time on the x-axis. And, and population, I'm not going to give you specific numbers for population either. I'm just going to show you uh, the relationship. That's what matters here. We're going to start, you know, the population would be low if it's closer here to zero, right? And then here would be um, massive spikes in population. So I'm going to show in this graph snowshoe hair um, numbers, right? These rabbits, I'm gonna show them green. And then in purple, I'm gonna show the Canadian lynx, like these big cats, the predators. So uh, let me graph the snowshoe hair uh, population first. Uh, you'll notice that it doesn't always just go up, like it's up and down. Our population numbers for things in the wild are constantly in flux, right? They have, uh, they have uh, a lot of up and down. So maybe, you know, if I said again that this is like, let's say this is 1950, maybe this right here is 1960. And then 19, um, actually that would be too much. Like maybe we're going by every five years, right? 55, 60, 65, 70, 75, 80, 85, 90. Yeah, let's say we're going every five years. So about every decade, it looks like um, the population dips, right? Something happens with the snowshoe hair. So my question is, right, if this is what happens to the snowshoe hair populations, right? They're up and down, they're up and down. Why are they up and down? And what relationship does it have with our predators? Now, sometimes when I ask students this, they immediately want to draw the Canadian lynx population um, being the inverse, right? But does this make sense, all right? If we're looking at one point in time, I'm going to grab a pen here again, right? If we're looking at one point in time, right here, would it make sense for the snowshoe hare population when it's at its highest for the Canadian lynx, the predator to be at its lowest. It wouldn't, right? Um, that means that when there's the most food, Canadian lynx for some reason are, are dead, are starving and dying. No, what, what, what you would expect to see is, right, when, when snowshoe hare are at their highest, right, and food is plentiful, right, you should see Canadian lynx start to um, fall in line here. So I'm gonna erase the pen and I'm gonna actually show you what it really looks like. So as it turns out, that purple line was incorrect. The Canadian lynx um, will actually lag behind it a little bit, right? This one makes way more sense. You know, you know this, it doesn't perfectly mimic it, um, but right here, let's say, remember, if we were going every five years, we said, let's say 50, this was 1955. And let's say in 1955, hare populations are just booming, right? There's tons and tons of rabbits. Now, because there's tons of rabbits, the Canadian lynx are on the rise because they're eating, and about a year later, they peak. But when they peak, can they, the, the snowshoe hare have to start to fall. Do you see that? So um, they're completely interdependent on one another. Um, snowshoe hare populations rise and fall um, with Canadian lynx populations because uh, they drive one another's success and downfall. All right, so the last thing I wanna talk about are trophic cascades. So if we understand predator-prey relationships and we understand how things are interdependent on one another, um, I think trophic cascades will be pretty easy to comprehend. So um, a trophic cascade is, is very interesting. This is when we eliminate the apex predator in an ecosystem and watch the impact that that has on the rest of the ecosystem. So I'm gonna give you a specific example. When I started teaching at Little Shoot High School, um, actually, Mr. Potsner approached me. He had uh, just built a pond uh, on his on his um, on his land, and he was having this algae problem, right? And that would be our phytoplankton right down here. Um, so I don't know why this is gray, by the way. Let me try to change this pen color. Sorry about that. Let me erase and grab a new pen color here, just to make it helps it stick out a little bit. We'll go with red. All right, so he was having this algae problem. Um, the, he had this man-made pond, and he would go outside, and he would notice that like, there was always a huge amount of algae growing on the top of the water. And he would grab a net, and he would net the algae out, and he would get rid of it. Um, and it was frustrating because that algae would just keep coming back and it would keep coming back. And he didn't want to put chemicals into the water because he also had a bunch of fish. He had stocked his pond with different fish. Now, of course, this trophic web, folks, this energy pyramid is not for Mr. Posner's pond. He obviously didn't have, you know, great white shark. This is actually one in the ocean. I couldn't find a, an illustration that really showed a, a man-made pond here in Wisconsin. So you'll have to bear with me. But let's pretend 
that Mr. Potzner's pond did have sharks and then some some mackerel and some herring and you know some small zooplankton and crustaceans and then some phytoplankton. Um, if that was the case, you know he could, in order to control the phytoplankton population, continue doing what he was doing and keep killing them off. But you're never going to kill all of them, right? And we and we know that unless you get rid of all of the life, life tends to reproduce. So the algae were gonna keep coming back, particularly if it was sunny in the backyard and maybe some lawn clippings were going in there and providing some good fertilizer for that phytoplankton. Um, so it's really, really hard to control them. So what I said is stop, stop concerning yourself with the algae, the phytoplankton, and instead, I told Mr. Potzner to go fishing. Now, what I would have told him to fish for here would have actually been the great white shark. I would tell him, you need to get rid of your sharks. And if you get rid of your sharks, your algae problem will also go away, which I know on the face of it sounds ridiculous, um, but it's actually true because if you killed off all of these sharks, you create what we call a trophic cascade. There's a waterfall effect where all of the other populations are affected as a result, which makes total sense, right? So if I kill off the sharks, what happens to the mackerels? Well, they have no predators anymore, right? So the mackerel predator or the mackerel population numbers will start to spike because nothing is killing them anymore. And as they start to spike, they're going to eat more. And as they eat more, herring populations will start to decline. And as that happens, crustaceans will start to spike. And as that happens, algae will decline. So, uh, right, as, as, as you impact one on the top in this instance, um, that's why we call it a cascade, right, because it's trickling down, um, you can actually impact all the way down to the primary producer. And this is what's kind of fascinating. We've actually seen this happen even in Wisconsin when it came to hunting, um, when, it, when it came to hunting uh, uh, gray wolf. Uh, we found that as, as gray wolf populations, as we opened up hunts on gray wolves um, and we killed them off, deer populations increased and it had a negative effect on, on, um, on farmers, on agriculture. Uh, and that's, again, because of the trophic cascade. So that is it for today. I'm going to end it here. We are done with trophic dynamics now. I hope that all of this made sense to you. Um, as always, if you have any questions, please let me know. But otherwise, take care.